an education manager at Ampersand. I've uh, been with the company since 2007. Um, my roles here have really evolved based on my background as an artist. And I also have, uh, I, I worked for five years making oil paint at another company and, and in art retail. Um, so I've, and I did gallery work for a number of years. So I, I've kind of aligned myself more with, with the artist than the production side of things, um, which is exactly what I like um, because we, we make a broad variety of products for a broad variety of uses. And I, I just love seeing what people do uh, when they get their hands on them. Um, my primary roles are in uh, helping people understand our products because we, we have some really unique and specific uh, items that we offer. And also I, I work with our uh, Ampersand Artist Ambassador team uh, to help support them to, to do the same thing to help people understand our products and to see what what makes them choose them for their own work that's great so dana uh, with that you know i know your time is awfully precious so how about if i share my screen and we start with the powerpoint and you can kind of just um you know talk as much as you want about any of the slides okay sure okay great let's go okay so let me find my powerpoint and let's start at the top. We have a beautiful logo. Um, just in chat, let us know how many of you have used ampersand panels before. If you have a favorite one, you know, maybe you'll you'll pop that into chat. But um, while you're doing that, Dana's going to um, talk about, let's go to the, um, uh, hang on a second, go down. Whoops, my computer has a mind of its own. There we go. Let's just start with the, uh, the history. Sure. So, uh, ampersand began. Uh, it was the clayboard existed before ampersand did, and clayboard was our first product. It's the uh, product in the picture there with the green label. Um, there was an artist in Colorado named Charles Ewing who was making uh, clayboard clay coated panels for his own use, which involved a scratch boarding technique. He'd build up the work with ink come back with scratch tools or sharp knives and re-expose the clay. Um, he, was, he had a good friend who was a student in, in a business uh, school in, in uh, Austin, Texas, named Elaine Salazar. And she thought that he had a great product and she wanted to see how she could bring that to a broader audience of artists. So uh, in 1993, uh, she and a few of her classmates had put together uh, a business model around Clayboard, won a national competition that then allowed them to start Ampersand. Um, first sale was to Pearl Paint in New York in 1994. So that was all off of one product. Now we offer 10 different panel types, plus accessories, plus frames for panels as well. Yeah, it is amazing. I, I mean, just just a quick question. Are you working on like future products as well? Or is this kind of like- Always, always, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, we're always interested in, in what that next product could be, but we're also, we think about our product surf, surface options in terms of absorbencies and textures, um, how those work for different media. And so if you could think about like a, a spectrum of very absorbent to less absorbent and very textured to less textured. We, we think about where those current 10 products fit within that, within that space and what's missing um, or how we can improve upon existing products for sure. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, uh, I, I was really impressed when I, I saw a video of like comparing, like you were talking about the surface texture um, cause you, you have ultra, ultra smooth, you know, for really fine detail, but then you've got other surfaces that are kind of, you know, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Like, um, yeah. what would be the coarsest surface you have and what would be the smoothest you have? Well, so different media requires a different type of surface, right? So watercolor needs absorbency to bond well with the surface. It's not, it's going to beat up on something that's really slick and not absorbent. Uh, likewise, uh, dry pigments like pastels or charcoal need some tooth so they can really grab on. 
So we consider what those those differences are with different surfaces to to come up with our specialty coatings, and some of them have expected uses. Um, but it really comes down to surface texture and absorbency. Our smoothest surfaces are clayboard, which is glassy smooth, and we also offer a, a gessoed surface called the Artist Panel Prime Smooth that's very slick surface too. Um, but the range also goes to more textured surfaces like aquaboard, which has a feel kind of like a, a cold pressed watercolor paper, or pastel board, which has marble dust in it uh, to give it some some tooth, more like a sandpaper finish for grabbing dry pigments. Okay, and I, I do have a question real quick, and I'm sure others, and by the way, everybody, um, we're going to have questions at the very end of this. There are not that many slides, so um, if you could hold your questions until the very end, but I do have a quick question while we're on this slide, um, and, and that is that of all of these boards, um, would you say that the clay board being the very first one that, that your company created can handle the, the most mediums, like everything from encaustic to cold wax to acrylic to inks, um, watercolor, or is there another board that would be kind of a one one board fits all? Not not well, board, but yeah. So there, um, I would say encaustic board is a very strong mixed media surface. Works for so many different things. Um, the reason that clay board and, and encaustic board are really great for so many media, though, is because they have uh, a nice uniform texture and the absorbency is pretty good. So uh, a, a lot of artist materials require absorbency, uh, gouache, uh, tempera, watercolor, markers, inks. So uh, having some absorbency, at least, really helps to open up a surface is uh, the range of, of media that a surface can be used with. Okay. Um, that said, it, as long as the surface absorbency and texture combination works for a particular media, there's, you know, the sky's the limit with what an artist can use any of our panels for. So pastel board is a great example. It's called pastel board because it was de designed for use with pastels but it's, it's an absorbent textured surface. So we hear from acrylic painters, ink and charcoal artists. Um, you, you can do a lot of different things on our boards regardless of what they were intended for. Amazing, yeah. It's, it's just kind of mind blowing because um, I, you know, I, I believe that these are the best panels I've ever worked on. It doesn't even matter what medium. And like you said, you know, if you have a board, encaustic board, and you're like, but I wanted to do acrylic, uh, the cool thing is you look on the label, and the label tells you all the mediums you can do on it. And, you know, th there's no guessing game. And, you know, I think a lot of artists are very, very careful about, you know, they want to do the, they want to choose the right surface and match it with the right medium. But rarely do we find, you know, one panel that can be very good for so many wide, a wide variety of mediums. So let's let um, let's move to the next slide. We can always come back to this one. But um, originally, when I reached out to Dana, just so all of you know, um, you know, one of my favorites has been the encaustic board. When I travel to workshops, you know, early, I remember in the early days, um, I went to a workshop and uh, Dana had sent me a, a lovely um, panel to work on uh, as a demo that was in for Cullowee Mountain Arts and. You know, it was a beautiful, beautiful surface, and it, it had it was cradled, and you know they sent that to me, and I was able to do my demo. And ever since, you know, way back um, when I first started using encaustic board, because I I am an encaustic artist as well, but I found that the, it works so well for cold wax and oil. So maybe Dana, if you could just like maybe you know we'll pick out this one board, and if you could talk about just this one particular board and talk about all the mediums that you could do on just this one particular surface. Well, so encaustic board is, is a surface with a lot of absorbency. It has uh, the most absorbency of any coated surface we offer, and that's because of its intended use with encaustic. You want that molten wax to soak deeply into the surface before it cools, so you get a really strong bond with the, the coating and the paint. Um, 
So absorbency is a big characteristic of encaustic board, as is its finish. It has a slight tooth. It's not glassy smooth at all. It has uh, a, a finish that kind of feels like suede where it has a, a bit of a texture. Um, so that combination makes it work really well for a broad variety of materials. It works great. I love it with ink and charcoal, colored pencil, um, watercolor pencil, but you can also use it with acrylics, gouache, uh, collage, of course, graphic markers. Uh, you can get a lot of blending with graphic markers, um, mixed media techniques. Uh, because of that slight texture, you can get a lot of, of good impasto and thick textures if you want to build up like oil paint with uh, palette knife techniques. Um, it, it really lends itself to a broad variety of, of techniques and media for sure. And can you talk a little bit about scraping into it? Like, let's say you've got a thin layer of cold wax and oil or a thick layer and you want to get out your awl or your, you know, razor blade or what a nail and you want to just like scrape with a ruler and dig out uh, a straight line. What, I mean, is it okay? Like how, how easy is it to break through that gesso surface and, and is it okay to do that? And, and like when you get down to the clay board surface, is there any problem with doing that? No, there's, there's no problem with doing that. In fact, because it's a rigid support, a wooden panel, that, that lends itself towards that kind of uh, manipulation and, and you know heavy work. Um, but the coating itself, the reason it has such absorbency is it's also a very high solid uh, uh, material. There's very low binder, very low, uh, a very low amount of the binder in that uh, ground coating. So it's, it's basically rocks. So you're scraping against rocks. So you get that sound when you scrape against it. <laughs> if you're touching that, you know, scraping against the actual surface. Wow. Um, but it can really take a lot of uh, manipulation with, with tools and carving back into. Um, you can cut through it. It's a, it's a coating on a, on a wooden panel, but it takes a, a pretty purposeful or, or uh, strong repetition of motion to get there. Yeah, I can't say I've ever done it. I've, but I've not seen it done. Yeah, box I've knives. Like, oh, yeah, I've seen box knives cut through it, but okay. I just yeah. thought it's it's too beautiful, too precious, too delicate. Now I know it's like a rock. <laughs> it's, it's pretty hardy. It's it's you know, and another thing about it being a, a high solid ground like that is that that's on purpose for its intended use also, which not only gives it the absorbency. But it means it can really take those exposed, um, uh, you know, exposure to heat over and over again during uh, an encaustic painting process. That's a good question too regarding the heat because I have never done this before. But let's say you've just got your first coat of say encaustic on there, or just even beeswax. If you if you just like you know pointed your torch at the surface, would you ever burn? Can you burn the gesso? You, you can, you can. It's designed to withstand uh, standard encaustic temperatures of around 200 degrees. You can go above that, but if you take a, a heat gun and turn it on high and hold it in one position, you will eventually, you know, reach high enough temperatures that you will, you will burn the surface. Okay, good to know. And, and I think anybody would expect that to happen, but... <laughs> Okay, and um, you know, and I don't know if how much you want to like talk about this, but yeah. you collaborated with RNF. Well, this is this is a pretty exciting part of uh, how the encaustic board came about because um, it illustrates two things. One of them is that uh, you know ideas can come from a lot of different places. Uh, another is that um, we love we love to work with the experts, so. You know, we, we were approached by RNF handmade paints, um, makers of encaustic paint, oil sticks, um, lots of lots of different materials, um, in around 2009. And prior to that, we'd been, you know, uh, recommending that our clay board be used with encaustic paint, which it still can. Um, but they came back to us and talked about how they would they would love to see clay board with more absorbency. Um, so that it really allowed a deeper penetration of the, the paint uh, and the uh, encaustic medium. So 
we we were like, you know, what what kind of materials would you use for this? They already offered uh, an encaustic ground, an encaustic gesso um, for artists to prepare their own surfaces. So we used this as a starting point and we uh, looked at how that coating would work on our, our panels and modified it to work with our applications and to, to see how we can improve it for adherence to uh, a, a sealed and coated panel. Um, we did all kinds of testing. Uh, you know, I did a lot of, a lot of applying just medium and paint and putting things in freezers or in humid areas and moving, you know, putting paintings in the least ideal situations I could um, to see how panels would fare and how the paint films would fare on the surface. But RNF really uh, was the spark of inspiration in, in developing encaustic board. And, and um, uh, you know, we work with them closely to this day. That is so cool. And yeah. I'm sort of, I, I personally had a bad experience using encaustic gesso from RNF um, myself. And so, you know, I was working on a very large scale painting and had it in a big gallery. And then, you know, they called me and said somebody was like looking at my painting and like they noticed that there was like a bubble underneath the encaustic paint. And I was horrified. Um, and so, what I, what I can, I guess the reason I'm telling you that is because I, I realized that the way that you uh, added this RNF gesso to your panels is like, it's, it's rock solid. It's like the best it can be. So if you like, if, if you try to do that on your own with RNF gesso on a panel, I just say that based on my experience, things can go wrong and really wrong because I lost those paintings. <laughs> um, so can you just talk about maybe how long it took you to get to get that perfect surface and like, you know, it's so smooth. And like you said, it's kind of like suede. And do you put several codes or is it just one code? Or if you don't want to share that too, that might be proprietary, but I'm just curious because I, I really did not have, like I did something wrong. And so I'm, I'm a little gun shy about RNF gesso on its own, but I do know that if I use an ampersand panel with RNF gesso, I have nothing to worry about. So I don't know, can you speak to like people who want to use RNF gesso on their own versus your ampersand panels? Well, um, I don't know what the situation was with the, the paintings that you're referencing, of course, but what we, what we do with our panels is we use an extremely uh, dense substrate to begin with. So all of our museum series panels, which are any of our products with names ending in board, like clay board or encaustic board, they have a substrate of our, our hardboard sub support. And hardboard is extremely dense and warp and moisture resistant. But then before we apply any coatings, we apply uh, a two-part sealer uh, on top of the wood to create a barrier between the wood and the coatings. Mm -hmm. And that does uh, serves purposes for archival reasons. It blocks the acids in the wood from getting into the ground coatings, um, but it also uh, creates a strong uh, bond with the wood, which then allows the, the ground coatings like encaustics, uh, the encaustic ground for encaustic board to bond really well with that polymer coating. So mm -hmm. we get a very singular and solid uh, permanent painting panel. Wow. So okay. that makes it, makes it very strong, makes it work really well. And uh, you, you can't, you can't just peel that coating off because it's chemically bonding with the sealer below it. Yeah, that is really, truly amazing. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, slide here. Um, if you want to just talk a little bit about the rigorous testing, which I yeah. think you already talked a little bit about. Yeah, I, mean, I touched on this a little bit already, but you know, I was, every time a new coating or a new size was uh, developed, we, you know, the first thing I would do is heat up my, my palette and get some paint out and uh, put down the coats of medium, hit it with a hot you know, uh, heat gun um, and do this over and over and over again and, and try, to make things, try to make things fail. And uh, you know, that involved putting, putting thick applications uh, on panels and then sticking them in the freezer and then banging them against the floor, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, just to see how well the paint held up and how well the boards held up. But 
But while we do a lot of internal testing and know a lot about the materials that we're using from the beginning, uh, this was a, a brand new product for us. And so we worked with uh, 20 artists nationwide, um, got them prototypes to try, have them put them into their own real life studio use and uh, answer lots of questions. I, I looked back at that questionnaire last week and I can't believe uh, how generous artists are with, with answering five pages of questions about, about their process and a new, new material. Um, but we learned a lot from that interaction, a lot, you know, in, in particular that helped us to create the product that we ended up coming to the market with. The, the process from the first meeting about encaustic board to when it was available in stores, the process was about uh, 14 to 16 months. Wow, like that. that's a lot of time. Yeah. yeah, well, and I think that says a lot about your company too and that um, your level of, you know, reaching out to people who are actually using your product and asking for feedback and then, you know, acting on it. Um, that's something that I, you know, whenever I get that from a company, it's like, wow, I can't believe they care. <laughs> So um, that's one thing, again, that I, I really do appreciate about your company. Like there's so many things that you are a family business and, you know, um, I, I just have been following a little bit about your history and um, like my appreciation for, it's not just your products, it's for like your whole mission, the fact that you are like a family company. There's so many things, you know, that it's nice to get a product from the USA and um, yeah. So, okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Well, I, I do want to go back to something that you just touched on that I, I didn't mention with the history is that Elaine Salazar that, that really uh, prompted um, the creation and the, the founding of Ampersand Art Supplies. She's still our president and CEO. Oh. Her office is still kitty corner from mine. It, our office is six people. Um, and we're located about 20 miles from where it all started. We're, we're still in the area and we're still doing things pretty much the same way yeah. um yeah but just innovating and growing all the time you have a great job <laughs> <laughs> i mean you get to paint on right. your job that's that's so cool um and i this is just a little personal side little thing for me saying i love these boards for encaustic mm -hmm. and oil and coal wax um but you know what other mediums that, that's already been covered um forgive me for i i had the slide way before um you know I met with Dana. So um, he's already answered that. And then, you know, also works great with, he's already said this, works great with pencils, charcoal, acrylic, collage, and pan pastels and um, wonderful. And oh yeah, pan pastels work wonderfully on that surface because of its kind of soft tooth, yeah. I'll have to try that. Oh, that just sounds like a great idea. Okay, so one question and let's say that there's this, this, is that you by the way, or is that Rebecca? Oh, that's, that's my hand. Oh, it is, okay. Well, yeah. anyways, you're using pan pastels, and one question that I get a lot, and again, we're going to open this up to Q and A, but this idea of mixed media. Um, now, here, if you're using pan pastel, which is a dry medium, and let's say that you use like a uh, art graph crayon, and then you used a um, graphic crayon or whatever pencils or things that are water soluble, do you lock those in or need to lock those in with something before you proceed on to the next layer, which might be water-based like acrylic or it might be cold wax and oil. Do you have to, um, do you have to, and what would you use to lock in those marks? So if I were going to go over that with something uh, like water-based, the, the things I would consider is, um, you know, are, are the materials that I'm introducing next going to change or move the things I've already applied. So, you know, if I were doing that over pan pastels, charcoal, things like that, water's definitely gonna smear and, and paint uh, with those pigments. So yes, I would lock those in place. Um, the thing I would use to lock it in place would, would be determined largely by what that next application was. So if I were using say acrylic paint next or, uh, in caustic, I would choose different things. So for acrylic paint, there are lots of acrylic based uh, fixatives out there. Um, Krylon, Golden, Lascaux, Sennelier, there, these spray applications would lock uh, that initial artwork in place. 
uh, without brushing something on that would disturb it. And so that would allow you a layer then uh, between what you'd already applied and what was coming next. So then I could paint on it freely without risking moving or smearing uh, what I'd already done. That makes sense. Right. And then if it's, um, are, do you also paint with, say, cold wax and oil, for example? Yes. Okay. So if you were to, to put the pan pastels down first, uh, what is there something you could lock that in aside from just using cold wax medium? I was just going to say cold wax medium. So, um, there are, you could use other uh, oil mediums. Um, there are oil mediums that you could use uh, to lock that in place. But also, oils can be used over acrylics also. So you could use those same acrylic-based fixatives, uh, a workable fixative or uh, a fixative spray over those initial applications, and then work with oils and cold wax on top of that without any any issues there, you know, affecting the drying at all. So that would be that, fine too. Is that because the fixative is such a thin, you know, it's a spray on, so it's a very thin layer. Is that why? Uh, it's also because it dries, you know, relatively quickly. You know, it tra you wouldn't want to do that on top of the oil applications because of the way that they dry more slowly. Um, but but putting that underneath, it's it's kind of like the the standard practice of applying acrylic gesso or acrylic paint and then oils on top of that. That order of things would be fine. So applying a fixative to lock a drawing in place or um, dry pigment artwork like pan pastel in place. Um, and then working on that with oil and cold wax would work just fine. Okay, perfect. Wow, that, that answers a big question that I, I get that question a lot. And I, I think a lot of people wonder that. Okay, so let's um, yeah. on here um, and just talking about formats. Um, that's the other great thing about your boards is they come in a wide array of sizes, thicknesses, whether they're cradled or not. And then you've got these wonderful um, floater frames, which are amazing because they work with the standard sizes. Um, did you want to comment anything about, like what is the largest size you would go for your typical encaustic board or gesso board or cradle? Yeah, so that's, a, that's a great question. So um, I, I like that this is addressed here in this picture because the only quarter inch standard uh, format that Ampersand offers are these sizes and this surface that, that are listed here. Um, all of our standard products in flat versions or cradled versions are an eighth inch panel, um, cradled or, or flat. Uh, the quarter inch thick format for these sizes, eight, eight by eight uh, to 11 by 14, um, comes out of the testing that we did. And when encaustic paint cools, it tightens and, and creates a tension on a surface. So we found that, you know, 12 by 12 sizes, uh, 11 by 14 sizes in an eighth of an inch thick. When we would really layer on paint and really heat that surface up and let it cool, we were getting warping. And so uh, we went with a thicker quarter inch panel for those uncradled, unsupported uh, sizes you know, between eight by eight and 11 by 14, because we wanted that panel to be able to take uh, its intended use. And so if you go larger than 11 by 14, it, you're saying it, it's, it's two things. It's number one, cradle to prevent warping. Right. And, and because it's cradled, you can go to the 1 8 inch top. Right. OK, wow, that is very cool. I don't think I realized that before. Um, warping uh, for, for people who've just joined the, the you know, enca um, encaustic like painting with fire um, year long course. You know, I've heard that question about, well, what do you do? I'm working on something that just warped. So I'm, I'm glad you addressed the warping because that's a big deal. <laughs> so definitely density, thicker, well-supported is important with encaustic painting, uh, not just because of the, the heat involved, but the weight of the paint, the physical weight of the paint. Um, so we offer encaustic boards up to 36 by 48, but those are cradled and braced uh, designed um, to be held still. 
And I saw Mark Witzling on the call. Um, he he um, typed in the chat a little tidbit that might might be something you would talk about. Do you create custom panels? Because he said you created some custom panels for him. We, we do. Um, we have a, a custom calculator on our website under the Where to Buy tab. And if you click on that calculator, uh, you can play around with different uh, surface uh, panel depth, cradle depth um, configurations to, to see what those prices would come out to. Um, and you can submit a request for a formal quote that, through that same form, through that part of our website. Can, can yeah. you approximate, like let's say I wanted one customized panel, um, whatever, uh, 36 by 60, or you probably have it, but let's say you didn't. Um, compared to, to the boards that you have that are already in stock, like what, can you just estimate what percentage extra you pay for a custom panel? Uh, it's hard for me to do it that way because okay. we actually just break it down to, to materials cost, labor cost, and that's how we get the price. Um, I could pull up that I could pull up that calculator and give you an idea, but we, we uh, it is more than standard sizes, or it's at least comparable to those standard sizes in their uh, suggested retail price, the list price. Mm -hmm. um, it's not discounted like a, a, one of our more mass produced yeah. um, standard sizes that you'd find in in uh, retail stores. Um, we hand make everything, but custom sizes are done by a single person um, with extra care taken to make sure that size is perfect, the panel's perfect. Um, it doesn't go through our standard production process. Uh, it's done separately. Okay, and, and quick question about maybe not necessarily the custom size, but maybe this question pertains to both custom versus um, your regular size boards. Do you have quantity discounts? Uh, on customs, yes, we don't still sell standard items direct. Um, right. But customs, uh, if you get identical items in in quantities, uh, we do have quantity breakdowns uh, for custom items. Very nice. Okay, awesome. And what is is there like a size you would not go larger than? Like, what's the largest you would go with a custom cradled, um, say, encaustic board? So we're limited by raw materials and our equipment. Um, so forty eight by ninety is our largest possible custom size, and, and we make those fairly frequently. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, let's move on then. Um, okay, so here we go. Did you want to comment on this? Um, again, again, all this information, everybody, is in their fantastic YouTube videos, which they have a YouTube video for every single type of board they have. But I thought this was interesting how you've got three different depths. You can see the really wide, deep cradle. Some people love that, and, you know, um, any comments about that, Dana? So we we offer cradle depths um, to give artists different presentation options primarily. Um, there are sizes that we don't offer without cradles because we want them to be held still. Um, but in general, the, the 7 8 inch and the inch and a half depths are based off of canvas depths and, uh, you know, and what canvas uh, could be found with those stretcher bar thicknesses. Um, the two and an eighth is a, a presentation uh, size. It's not only extra strong for really big sizes, for example, the, the 48 by 72 and 48 by 60 inch panels that we offer standard, the depth is that, that two inch cradle plus the eighth inch panel. Okay. Um, but these are sizes that are generally designed to have uh, no frames, the cradle becomes the presentation. You can either stain it, wax it, paint it, leave it exposed, um, or have some sort of custom molding made for, for framing. But generally the, the first two uh, are designed for frames and the, the two inch cradle for display without. Um, that said, anything with the cradle can be displayed without a frame if you choose. Uh, but frames do offer uh, finished presentation and uh, additional protection for the artwork. Awesome. Yeah, okay, nice. Um, let's see here. There's anything you want to touch on here? Um, 
Yeah, so I guess the last point is one I want to touch on briefly. Um, encaustic painters can work on raw wood. There's no, there's no reason to have a coating um, unless you want uh, a consistent and even white surface. Um, encaustic is uh, a medium that really allows a lot of light movement within it. And I, I think that in you know, some projects or for some uh, artwork, having that solid white surface really does allow more of that light to reflect back to the viewer through that paint layer and gives it a, a more uh, brilliant luminosity. Um, but because that surface works with so many different materials, uh, you can also take advantage of that in terms of mixed media techniques, employing uh, collage or uh, pencil work or, or other things into, into your painting as well. Yeah, and I, I can speak to that a little bit as well as any encaustic artist who's on this uh, this Zoom call in that if you work on raw wood and you, you tend to want to use cool colors, um, and I learned this in the very early days, um, you know, you, you mix cool and warm together and it's not so great. Um, whereas if you start on a cool surface and you love cool colors, I mean, you know, those cool colors are just, they pop on your encaustic boards because of that white surface. And yeah. although you can, you know, glue paper down and you could put a coat of white encaustic paint, there's nothing like being able to start on a white encaustic board. It's just it's like the dream surface. It's so nice. Um, okay. So I just wanted to show you that I have used a lot of, um, you know, I'd say that like my favorite paintings now, now I'm just like looking at the slide and realizing that all of my favorite paintings are on the encaustic board. So maybe I need to only use encaustic board from now on. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, oh, it's time to choose three prize winners before we, well, let's just do our Q and A first and then we'll choose the prize. Yeah, let's do Q and A. Okay, so let me just um, unshare here. And we're going to see, come on now, computer, stop share. Okay. All right. Now, we're going to go into gallery view. So how many of you have questions for Dana? And uh, there are two ways that you can ask a question. Uh, if you feel like you want to just unmute, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Or if you feel more comfortable, just typing in the chat. And I will try to then, um, I'm looking at chat right now. So. Either way, you can either unmute or you can type in chat and I will relay your question over to Dana. Anybody with a question? I do have a question. Okay. Um, I am due for painting in those boards and I was wondering for hanging, I you use the same uh, wires and uh, what do you, the same way you uh, do uh, uh, a regular canvas? Uh, so the question is about displaying, uh, you're talking about cradled panels, I presume. Um, with that framing around the back for support, it, it's also a great uh, opportunity to attach the hanging hardware directly to that cradle. So you're absolutely right. And for um, the sizes that are available, uh, standard uh, attaching D-ring hangers or uh, screw eyes, depending on the size of the piece, and uh, attaching the the appropriate uh, weight hanging wire works wonderfully. So that's that's a great option for presentation for uh, cradled panels. For larger, heavier work, there are options like. Uh, uh, cleat hangers or cleat style hangers, sometimes called French cleats, that we recommend for uh, larger, heavier pieces. And those are it's essentially a flat hook where uh, one co component of that flat hook is attached to the back of the cradle, the other to the wall where it will be hung horizontally. And then you rest the, the hook from the cradle onto the one on the wall and it holds it nice and still and flat. And those things are, they're designed for earthquake proof. Uh, it, it also holds the artwork a little closer to the wall for a more flush presentation. Um, 
I like them because for bigger pieces, what I'm leveling is a little metal bar rather than trying to, you know, finagle a, a big heavy artwork um, so I can get everything positioned and measured and, and attached to the wall just with that little bar and then hang the, the work up and it looks wonderful. But yes, wire and, and screw eyes or, or D rings works great uh, for all of the standard available sizes and for most uh, presentation options. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, Dean, I'm gonna walk back here and, and chat here. There's some questions. Um, we were talking about encrusted boards and Leslie Corey asked, what about egg tempera? Can you work with that? Yeah. Sure, egg tempera. So um, the surface that Ampersand generally recommends for egg tempera is uh, clayboard. And clayboard has a, a very smooth surface. It's like a polished surface, very similar in, in uh, how it works to traditional powdered gesso. Um, the difference is in its absorbency is uh, more in the surface than deep, which is why encaustic board is a better encaustic surface than, than clay board. So what I do when I work with clay board is I just give it a, with an egg tempera, is I just give it a, a, a quick once over with a, a 3M finishing pad. And these little synthetic, uh, it's like sandpaper essentially, it gives just a slight tooth to the surface. And uh, then I make sure it's dust free. I, I wipe it off with just a little bit of uh, rubbing alcohol, let it sit and uh, it's ready to go. It works great with egg tempera. Mm -hmm. um, with egg tempera on encaustic, there's so much air uh, caused by that absorbency in those pockets where uh, those pores of the surface um, that, it, that it doesn't create a very strong bond initially or you get some sinking in. Um, you know, a texture to it that you're maybe not after, uh, where clayboard smooth surface allows you a lot more, a lot more brush control. Cool. Okay, we have another question from Jennifer. She asks, how do you present the quarter inch panels? Set them in a floater frame or add a cradle to the reverse side? Those are both great ideas. So uh, Ampersand offers a line of floater frames and the 7 8 inch format, the, the shallower depth, um, comes with a set of risers. And these risers are just little wooden blocks to extend uncradled panels to the correct position in the frame. And there are riser blocks in that 7 8 inch frame that work well for an eighth inch panel. And if you turn it a quarter turn, they work for a quarter inch thick panel. So you can use them um, to to frame quarter inch panels in our floater frames. Another thing that we've seen done is, uh, you know, attaching cradles or versions thereof. So sometimes we see people attach just one piece of wood to the, the top of the work and then another one at the bottom to keep it uh, parallel with the wall. Um, sometimes we've seen them do it the other direction where it's one on the left side, one on the right side, and then they hang a wire between it. Um, Oftentimes when they're, when that's done, it's inset slightly from the edge, an inch, not a lot, but just enough so that that work then gets a floated look on the wall and you see edge to edge on the artwork, but you don't see that, that half a cradle that it's attached to. Wow, that's a great idea. If you're, okay. Thank you, Dana. Um, just another question on the end of that. If you're going to attach it to a full cradle like a square um how do you do that do you use a, a like a wood glue or do you tack it what's the best way to to do that it's a good question so there's there's two things that i want to talk about with that the first is that yes wood glue works great so if the cradle is made of wood or if that backing uh that support that adds the depth is made of wood uh then wood glue is the right choice the the back of all of our panels is just raw wood so that would create a good, strong, permanent bond. Um, the other thing I'd like to address with that is that matching two separate wooden pieces together, if they're made separately, can be tricky because if they're slightly larger or smaller, they could both measure the same amount, but if it's 
a 32nd of an inch or a 64th of an inch off, you might see that cradle peeking through um, from behind. So if doing that, I really recommend um, taking the artwork, the panel, tracing it onto a piece of paper, and then using that as the base template for creating that cradle uh, to make sure that it fits that particular panel best. Just simply sanding a panel at the end of the finishing process and manufacturing or, or a cradle will take off a little bit of wood and it might just be enough to make them not exactly the same size. Unless you sand it afterwards, but then you need the tools to do that and it's a little more involved. Which, which actually is how we make cradled panels in the factory. We make the panel slightly larger than the cradle so that it will always fit. Yeah. And then we router and sand them flush with one another later. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Marit Ho from Norway has a question. I just experienced warping on the exact formats, you know, flat boards. Could I apply gesso on the back to flatten the board or attach it to a cradle? A crate for encaustic painting, I would say a cradle is the best option. For other types of painting, I would say start with gesso, but because of the weight and the, the brittleness of uh, encaustic paint, uh, it's, it's not, a gesso is not going to pull it flat. But for a surface that was maybe just gessoed and then painted with oils or acrylics, uh, gessoing the back would be a good first step to help equalize that tension or get that tension from front to back closer. Um, with an oil or acrylic painting, you can also take the panel, I'm gonna grab a visual aid. So let's say I had warping, uh, making the surface, the painting surface concave. I could then take that panel turn it so that the bow went up, rested on something. I usually use, you know, if I'm gonna do this, I'd use magazines, books, something where I could get it the same height. And then I would put a weight in the center to slowly push it down beyond flat so that when I took it off, took that weight off, it would, it would be, you'd retrain the wood fibers to flat. With encaustics, creating that kind of pressure or or surface pressure on a finished painting is tricky. Um, and it can be done putting soft cloths on whatever you're resting the, the piece on. But I, I would say cradling or attaching some support to the back would be the best uh, way to get that panel flat again. Awesome, and then Anne Hanley. Now, Anne, I'm not sure if I understand your question, but she writes, hello, Dana, what is the best to use? to glue a painting on a paper substrate. Uh, I, you know, I meant uh, what is the best panel to use to, yeah. you know, I have large paintings on paper and I'd like to glue them down on board and I don't want it to warp. So I was wondering what the best surface would be. I, I totally get your question. And this is one that we see, this is a great use for panels. So. It not only adds stability and support to panels, I mean, to, to artwork on paper or fabric, but it also gives uh, a range of presentation options too. Um, if you're not utilizing the surface as a painting surface, then you can go with the most basic of, of panels. Um, there, like hardboard would be an example of that. There's no sealer on it. There's no coating on it. It would just be the raw wood panel. You can get it with cradles. You can get it in sizes, uh, a fairly wide range of sizes. But because the woods, all wood contains acids, I would recommend that you first seal the surface of the hardboard with either uh, a high solid acrylic medium, polymer medium, uh, Golden's gloss medium is one we recommend frequently, um, or a PVA size. Two coats of that would give you a, a barrier between the wood and your artwork that you're mounting. And then that would also create a good bond with uh, any polymer-based adhesives. You could use gel medium, for example, or, or gloss medium for the adhesive in that sense. I think um, Pam did a kind of a demo of that where she glued paper down on board. I just didn't remember if she 
treated the surface because I wouldn't want it to warp. So I was curious. I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I think if you use, if, I, I guess a larger piece maybe would keep it more st stable. I don't know, but Pam did a nice demonstration with that, but I couldn't remember if she treated the board or not. I believe she did, but. For larger uh, panels, I would recommend cradles uh, yeah. just because as that, those layers of glue dry and the thing that's mounted on it creates some pull. Um, for bigger sizes that are unsupported, that could create a, a cupping. A bow, a yeah. So mm -hmm. a cradle would be a, uh, my recommendation. Um, okay. But you could also use surfaces like clayboard, which have an absorbent surface, a smooth surface ready to use. And that's an already an acid-free uh, surface application, twice sealed and coated. So it, it would really hold its shape for one. And then for two, uh, you can skip that step of sealing it because it's already been done. Oh, that'd be good. Thank you. Yeah. So Dana, um, based on what Ann just said, and she's right, I, I do have a video um, that I've done both on YouTube and I think it's in the library. But anyways, you know, I use Lineco pH neutral adhesive and what I demoed there, Ann, and you may remember this, and this may be what you're talking about, but um, I guess what I've been taught or told by um, when I spoke with Gamblin is I put the first coat of Lineco down and it's quite thick and it's really soaking into the pores of the wood. So I have not prepped the raw wood and it's Baltic birch usually. Um, so it's sinking in and I let it sink in for like 10, 15 minutes, but I don't let it dry completely. So I let it dry to the tacky stage. And then I put the second amount of Lineco on there and it doesn't, you know, there's no more of it absorbing anymore because the first layer clogged all the pores in the wood. So I always thought that that kind of seals the wood. I didn't do the extra step of sealing the wood. Do you think I should be? Well, Lineco pH neutral adhesive is a different animal than, uh, than say using uh, an acrylic base or, or uh, like gloss medium. So um, we, we recommend sealing as a separate step and letting it dry. And we do that so that the tannins don't move into it, the water uh, promotes the movement by letting that first application of yours dry to a tacky level. Um, I, I would presume that any issues of uh, acid migration would be small, okay. um, but definitely just skipping that step altogether and brushing a wet material on and putting the paper on it while it's wet that that tannin and lignin characteristic in the wood is is trying to rise up into or, or be sucked up into that application. So uh, your process sounds pretty low risk to me, yeah. um, but we, we just generally recommend for uh, complete uh, barrier yeah. on the wood that it be a separate dry step. So really, so any if you use the clay board, then you don't have to to treat it. That's that's right because we've already twice sealed the surface of the wood before we applied the clay. It's a completely acid-free surface. Oh wow! So then you would just put the polymer, you just put the glue down. Whatever you're gluing, yeah, that's would right. Would it take longer to dry than if it was a raw panel? No. No, not really. Uh, clay board's a, uh, an absorbent surface. Um, it allows a good bond then with the glues. But it also, um, uh, because of that absorbency, things things dry pretty quickly to it. If I if I applied ink on the clay board, for example, by the time I rinse my brush off in water and run my finger across that brush mark that I just made or that ink mark I just made, I can't move it. It's already dry to the touch. It, it dry things dry in seconds. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Um, okay, I'm going through chat again, and there's a question from, uh, the one from Stephanie was, I think, already answered, and she asked, you know, are there options other than floater frames for displaying flat panels? I think you nicely described, you know, the, the blocks of wood, and um, another question from Christina Mallet, or uh, Mallow? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead and ask your question. Christina? Yeah, I, I in general, I, I'm an abstract painter, but sometimes I like to do portraits too. There is any of the boards um, 
better for oil without cold wax. It's oil only. Um, is any of the of the boards special for oils? So the the board that we've we have available that we've introduced for primarily used with oils and acrylics is our gesso board. And gesso board has a, a much lower absorbency uh, than several of our, you know, than any of our clay coated surfaces. So that means that you're gonna get that expected drying rate and that retain the glossiness of the, of the oil paint that you'd expect. Uh, you get the blending time. Gesso board is unique, you know, in that it's, it's, it's not unique in that it's an acrylic gesso coating. You can find acrylic gesso painting surfaces all over the place. But where it is unique is that it utilizes our, our rigid hardboard support and the surface texture is very slight. It's not glassy smooth like clay board or the artist panel prime smooth, but it just has a slight tooth kind of like an eggshell. So it's just enough to drag from the brush. Your brush marks will, you know, you, you'll see your brush marks unless you're using self-leveling mediums, but it also allows you to work with reductive or wiping techniques, wipe out techniques. Um, you don't see a texture of a surface come through thin applications or glazes. So you really get uh, what you put on it is what you see. So just just a board is the surface that I I was first introduced to uh, ampersand through. That was my my introductory surface um, mm -hmm. when I was working at the oil paint company, and we used them all the time for for going out and plain air painting. And what about um, oil pastels? Oil pastels would be anything that works great for oils, also. So you could use that with uh, with just a board as well. Okay. Um, some artists use it with uh, encaustic board because it has a slight tooth to it, but that absorbency does make blending a little tricky if you're working thinly. Um, another surface that we see used with, with oil pastels is our pastel board, um, which has a, a lot of tooth to it. For that reason, I generally don't personally uh, use it with oil pastels too much because it eats through my pastels pretty quickly. <laughs> But just just a board is is my personal okay. preference for that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, okay, uh, one quick question, Dana. If you're using RNF pigment sticks, which tend to you know, if you use like the real juicy thing, um, they can take a really long time to dry. So would it be really a good idea then, for that reason, to um, use like the encaustic board, which has the most absorbent surface? I would say yes, and Darren from RNF would disagree with me. <laughs> um, something with more absorbency does help speed the drying time. Uh, when I've worked with with them, with oil sticks in our boards, uh, he he doesn't really like that uh, faster drying. He likes to be able to blend them longer. Um, but I know I know what the, where the question comes from because I I used. Uh, a lot of oil sticks in the past, and I had a painting that took, I had a lot of lamp black, and I didn't add any um, drying mediums or any oil painting mediums, which, which is a great way to speed up the drying time on those too, by the way, is mix in oil painting mediums that speed up that drying time. I, I had a painting that was wet to the touch or at least tacky for five years. <laughs> yeah. So I, I still have that one. I, I couldn't show that one. <laughs> well, then what it, can I just, I'm sorry, you guys have other questions too. I don't want to hog all the thing, but, um, you know, Sonili, uh pastels are, are beautiful and luscious and, and all those things, but I was told they never dry. Have, what's been your experience with like a Sennelier pastel on an encaustic board? Have you oil, tried? Oil pastels don't dry. That's a, that's a characteristic of their binder. They're a, they use a non-drying oil in contrast to say an RNF pigment stick or a, a tube of oil paint, which has a drying oil in it. The drying oil oxidizes, dries, cures over time. It, it will reach a, a terminal hardness. Um, oil pastels use a non-drying oil. So it, it never reaches that state. Um, it doesn't oxidize in the same fashion as say the linseed oil in an oil stick. So what would be the point of ever using it if it never dries? You you frame it under glass. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. A question from 
uh, Marita again, can the sealant used for wall panels be used before the glue is applied? Going back to, I think, um, uh, adhering paper to panel. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah, and I'm not sure, can the sealant used for wall panels be used before the glue is applied? I'm not sure what the sealant for wall yes. panels is. I, th I think I understand the question. It's about sealing the wood, then using the glue to apply or mount something. Um, definitely, yes. And that would be our recommendation is that you seal that surface, um, let it dry and then glue the material on. And, and that, that could be the same material. Okay, a uh, question from Catherine Cookson. Uh, I might need some clarification here, Catherine. Why not use the artist smooth instead of clayboard? So for hearing I didn't like that. Yeah, uh, Danny you mentioned a board just recently that I had not heard of, which is the artist smooth board. Would that be better than the clayboard to adhere a paper of cold wax medium to that uh, surface? That's a or great. They that's a great question. So you, you could use that surface for that if you're gonna mount uh, paper. In fact, I use that surface quite a bit for that process, um, partially because it's a very basic panel and it's, it's sealed. It's part of our value series, which means that it's not available in a broad variety of sizes. Um, but if you have a size that's appropriate, that is certainly a surface. You could also use Jessa board, which has a uh, slight texture, but has a little bit of tooth to it. You could still mount mount things to gesso board. Uh, you can mount things to encaustic board. Um, pretty much if it's a sealed uh, panel, you can jump right to it. Things with too much texture like aqua board may be a little tricky to get a nice even mount without any air bubbles. But yes, the prime smooth surface is a, a great mounting surface. And I, I like to use it for um, photos primarily. I'll use a 3M adhesive, spray adhesive, apply Super 77 to the board, and then the back of the photo, piece them together, um, trim the edges. I'll never get those apart. Great it's idea. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's good. But if you put any type of glue on an encaustic board, um, that it's so absorbent that the glue just like would sink right in really fast, right? It depends on what you're using. So uh, like when I've used gloss medium on encaustic board, especially smaller pieces, eight by eight, eight by 10, I have no trouble using it as a mounting surface for canvas if I want a canvas panel or, or mounting a piece of paper to it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and then Leslie Corey asks, what about plaster application? Which board is best? Okay. Uh, plaster, plaster is a bit of a tricky one because of uh, the differences in viscosity and consistency. Um, encaustic board is one that we've seen used. We've seen clay board used for years um, with, with plaster. Um, hard board, uh, just the raw hard board is the one I see used the most um, for plaster. So any of those surfaces would work well. Um, but the most, the most commonly used one I see at this, at this point is, uh, just the raw hardboard. Cool. Okay. Well, listen, um, we have taken up a lot of Dana's time. So how about at this point, um, we take maybe one more question if there's somebody who has a question for Dana. And if not, we'll choose our winners and let him go. <laughs> um, no more questions. Okay, and you can pop it in the chat if you're shy. Um, I'm watching chat right now. I don't see uh, any other questions. So um, maybe it's time then, Dana, if you would be, uh, do the honor of choosing. Uh, now you can choose, you don't have to choose from the chat. You can actually look at all the names there um, <laughs> and choose three winners. I've just been randomly writing down names as we're talking. So okay. I'm just gonna pick at random. Um, so how about Rachel, Debbie, and Cynthia? Yeah, thank you, Dana, for choosing our winners. Um, everybody give them a round of applause. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I, I learned so much that I, I, and I've even like been trained to understand your panels, but I just learned a ton more. So um, thank you so much, Dana, for your time. And um, if I, um, 
if I can, you know, I'll let you go so you can do the rest of your job. But if I could ask you to join us on another day, another time, um, hopefully you might um, uh, give us that gift of time. <laughs> that, would, that would be fun. Um, I, I do want to remind everybody uh, of a few things. One, uh, we've got a YouTube channel that's that's got a lot of information. If you have questions, it's, there's demos there. Things are a little more a little more fun than reading. But if you want to do some reading, our website's also got a lot of articles and information about our products and techniques. Um, and aside from that, the email, the general incoming email posted on our website, on our products, on our brochures reaches me. So if you have any questions, drop me a line, uh, pick up the phone. I'm, I'm happy to visit with you about specific uh, things you want to address with your work. Thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, that is really, really great. And, and can I ask you one last question? I forgot. But in my studio, I've got these little sample panels. They're probably like five by seven, um, but they're all like rectangles and they fit in a nice little box. And I have one of each. Is that like a sample pack? Those little, um, do they have just like a folded paper label, just a piece of paper folded around each board? I think so. And they're flat. Yeah, just I, I'm going to see if I'm talking about the right, if we're talking about the same thing. Okay, because that's a great way, you guys, to try out like several different boards without spending a lot. You know, you can try them out and. Um, is it this kind of thing? Yeah, it's about that size. Or is it this kind of thing? Well, um, is that one a little bigger than the other one you showed me? No, this that's is five hard. by seven. These are three by five. It's the five by seven. And is that a pack of all aqua board or is that like one of each? This is a pack of each of the different coated surfaces we make. That's so it. On the label side. Okay, would you please send me a link to that and I'll share it with everybody. So oh, the, we, can't. we don't have a link for that because we don't sell them, um, but retail stores uh, do. So if you ever have trouble finding our products through retail stores, check out our, our where to buy section on the website or give me a call. I'm happy to help track down. Um, there's fewer retail, physical retail options than there were in 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times it's, it's a uh, online purchase, but yes, this is called the museum series sampler pack. Thank you so much. I'm going to look that one up. And or the five by seven sampler pack, I think. Five, is another five by seven. Pack. Perfect. Uh, sample pack. Great. Thank you so much, Dana. I'll let That's you go. Good. and Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye Thank now. You. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.